And we are back on The Chosen Journey with Steve Carsey, and we are on to Chapter 13, and we are keeping the Yankee theme going because, again, they are the top team in baseball. Uh, Steve, you indicated to me uh, during the break a uh, very interesting stat as far as how the Yankees need to play in order to win 100 games this year. You want to share that one? Yeah, I mean, it, it, just looking at the numbers, I mean, there's about 100 games left. If the Yankees would go 500 and go 50 and 50, uh, they would come close to winning 100 games. Um, so, like, it, you know, the second place team, I believe, is like 10 games behind. So uh, if you just do the math, it's going to be really hard for any of those teams to, you know, win the division behind them and, and are going to have to look at a, at a wild card. We're not even finished June yet. Like, we're taping this. It's, it's, it's mid-June, uh, June 20th. It's uh, for taping, and th that number just blows my mind as far as how far ahead they already are at. So I guess at this stage now, you can start resting players. You know, maybe they can get a bye. And no, it doesn't work that way. They still got to play. Baseball still has to happen. And one of the things we said was you do not win championships in June, but, man, they are looking good right now. Yeah, they're, they're a tough team. I've watched them a few times. Uh, you know, they got a really good – uh, middle of the lineup with Judge, who's having a career year, who turned down that contract and uh, bet on himself. I mean, obviously Stanton and Rizzo, uh, LeMayu is there. So uh, they have uh, a, a, a tough lineup and, and their pitching has done a really nice job of keeping them in games and uh, giving them the opportunity to win. So before going to our chapter, there's a couple of the, it's funny how stats and uh, numbers always drive baseball. But I'll let Steve tell these ones because he's told them to me already. One of the ones you, you brought up to me was the number of players who have actually played Major League Baseball. And being in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, you mentioned the capacity of the dome here, the Rogers Center. So if you'd like to tell the fans here again how to know how many players have actually played Major League Baseball. Yeah, not down to an exact T, but just north of 20,000 players have played Major League Baseball. Uh, whether it be a day or multiple days or years or uh, a decade, uh, just a little bit north of 20,000 people. So we take a stadium of 45,000, 50,000 capacity. It's half the stadium. And that's the amount of players that have ever played Major League Baseball. Less than half that stadium. I mean, you'd think 50,000 people. Half of that is 25,000, and you got 20,000 players who played in the big leagues in 150 plus years. So uh, it's an incredible thing uh, to understand. And, and, and if you really break down the numbers, it's like, you know, earth shattering to be like, wow, only that many players have played. So let's say we have a, a giant nightclub that has a 500 person capacity. If we take all the people that are in the Hall of Fame, are we going to fill that nightclub? No. Talk about a very hard Hall of Fame to get into. So, you know, the number of players who have played Major League Baseball, percentage-wise, it's 0.001% that actually end up in the Hall of Fame. The number of people in the Hall of Fame is? 340, and that's including executives, umpires, and managers. So, for that kid out there, whether you're in the Dominican, in Texas, Iceland, wherever you are, and dreaming of playing Major League Baseball, the odds population-wise for you are quite small. And the odds of making the Hall of Fame are just that much smaller. So for those ones that get enshrined into Cooperstown, you are part of a very select company in the world. And uh, 100%. It's uh, a very special select company uh, for players who have uh, played for a long time and been successful year in and year out. Uh, you know, so it's it's one of those things. If if you have an opportunity to go to the Baseball Hall of Fame into Cooperstown and walk through it and uh, love the game of baseball, it gives you everything you would have ever wanted. Uh, and it takes more than one day to go through it. Uh, it just gives you the history of baseball from the inception all the way through where we're at with all the greatest moments and all the greatest players. Uh, that, have, that have played the game. And uh, it's, it's really historical and just a special place to go. And, and it's really, uh, you know, a bonding place if you can go there with somebody you love or, or somebody you're teaching the game to. I can tell you, I went with one of my best friends the last time I went. We went first thing in the morning, went through it. 
I got kicked out as they were closing. I still didn't finish it in one day. It's so much to take in. It's just unreal. The whole feeling of being there. Well, you know what? Then maybe you can come again and meet me there and uh, we can walk through it because uh, the team that I'll probably be coaching in the fall and then in the spring uh, next summer is going to be probably going to Cooperstown to play in a 12U baseball tournament and uh, they get to experience uh, the Cooperstown dreams, uh, fields that they're playing on. So that would be a special trip. I could tell you it's not that bad of a drive from where I'm at. You got it. And how cool would that be for us fathers and sons to be able to take our boys through there together? I'm in buddy. All right. I love it. I love it. And, uh, like I said, for anybody out there who ever thought about going to the baseball hall of fame, if you haven't been, uh, I would highly recommend you guys going and learning the game and the history of baseball, uh, especially if it's your favorite pastime. I agree a thousand percent. It's life-changing. And if you are a borderline fan and you kind of like baseball, once you leave there, you're going to be a fan. Trust me. And speaking of the Hall of Fame, on today's chapter, somebody who had quite a presence and left his mark on baseball they call them the boss. Now, when you hear the words, the boss, you think Bruce Springsteen in wrestling, you think Sasha Banks in New York city, there's only one boss and that's Georgie Steinbrenner. So Steve had the pleasure of working for him with him, interacting with him. And today's chapter is all about the boss. That's awesome. I mean, he's, uh, he's a uni- again, another unique guy. Uh, who bought the team for, I believe it's anywhere between eight and $11 million in 1973 uh, and then built it up and uh, put his heart and soul into it. And when you think of the Yankees, you think of George Steinbrenner and family and uh, you know uh, it was great to, to get to know him. It was great to, you know, play for him as an owner and uh, you know, uh, obviously be able to uh, talk with him uh, on many occasions when I was, injuring my uh, injury when I was rehabbing my injured shoulder when I was down in Florida because that's where he lived and where he frequented very much at the Tampa complex if you were interacting with him while you were injuring your shoulder I don't think he would have been a very happy guy with you (laughs) (laughs) that is true Um, you are pretty much a a walking encyclopedia when it comes to baseball so you know the dates well on Steinbrenner Uh, the money he was best known for which industry the shipping industry very good. One of the things that I love the story, and it's one of those things that fables get told over time, and you don't know what is real, what is not. But the story goes, Steinbrenner had a room of investors. And so, and they were all silent partners. And if you're going to be working with Steinbrenner, you are going to be silent. And he said to them, if you want to work with me, I'm going to make it very simple for you. Shut up, and I'm going to make you a lot of money. And he did. Yeah, I mean, you just look, you just go back and look at it. I mean, the way he built it, the way he just, uh, you know, understood the game. And as a businessman, sometimes you don't think, you know, because business is business and sports is sports. But he was able to combine the two and make it a business. And he understood that if you put the, if you put the best product on the field, that you're going to get people in the stands. And when you put people in the stands, that means you're going to make money. And uh, he was making money hand over fist and uh, just grew it into uh, this team that, uh, you know, everybody knows around the world. But it's it's, it's ironic because, you know, people with their short term memories, long term memories. But, you know, for the for the last years of his ownership before his passing and as far as the legacy that he was left with, you know, you think of uh, the people he surrounded himself with over time and the legacy and the team you see today is built on what on what he started and his legacy continuing on but you trace it back for example in the 80s he was spending the money but not sending the results and the fans were not really thrilled with it you know and you know the changing of the managers and the reputation of the yanks it's amazing how it does come together eventually but you need to give it time. It's almost like I think of now the Cowboys and the reverse of it, where they were just winning championship after championship and championship. And then all of a sudden they still got this great owner, you know, still got this great team, great stadium, but they're not seeing the results for it. The Yankees are a very different story, but you know, you have to be patient, just spending money 
and putting together great players, it doesn't always come that way. You need patience. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I think at the end of the day, there's always a window of opportunity, right? Is what they call it. Uh, when you have a roster of great players who you have under control or under contract, everything has to go right. Guys have to stay healthy. Guys have to pitch well. Just because you have a name on the back of your jersey doesn't mean that you can just throw out your glove and expect to win every single game. So um, there, there are a lot of factors that go into to winning and putting teams together and the amount of chemistry that you need to have between the players uh, and, and the coaches. Um, and then understanding what that window of opportunity is to win and then how you're going to do it. But when you get to the playoffs, it's special. Um, but in the playoffs, things happen. A bad hop, a bad call, like things you have to get a little bit lucky. You know, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good, right? And at the end of the day, uh, all great teams don't win championships. You try to put your, your men or your team in position uh, to be successful and to win that championship because that's what you play the game for and that's what the owners want, especially when they're spending a lot of money like, like uh, the boss did. Uh, he expects results. And then, uh, you know, when he doesn't get them, it's, it's upsetting to him. It's upsetting to the fans, but it's not like the players aren't trying or aren't trying to win. It's just the way the ball bounces sometimes. You know, some teams where you're saying, you know, we have a shoestring budget and we put people together and making the playoffs was already a victory. And, you know, guys, you tried your best. I think, you know, from the outside looking in, no matter what level you are on that organization, there is that pressure. You know what you're set to do. You know why you're on this team. You know what you put together. And if it, it's, it's World Series or bust every single year. And I don't think anything has changed in that regard, except for the fact that, let's say, when you would have played with for him and with him at that time versus, let's say, 1980 Steinbrenner, I think there was a certain amount of mellowing. Yes, no, what do you think? I think so. I think uh, he learned to grow as he got a little bit older. I mean, good night. I mean, look at the, some of the drag out uh, arguments that he had with Billy Martin. When, when Billy Martin, he fired him five or six times and then rehired him five or six times. Uh, and, and, you know, when you're the owner of a club and you're the boss, you get to do what you want, right? You can fire whoever you want to fire and you can hire whoever you want to hire. But uh you know, uh, the good comes with the bad. And at the end of the day, I think he mellowed out. I think he grew, uh, but the competitiveness and, and the expectation to win from him never changed. But I think, you know, when Cashman grew into his role, Tori, as, as far as number of years in his role, there's no coincidence, you know, that if, when you have an arm in, you need a sergeant, a lieutenant, you have the right people in place. And that continuity, I think that set a very good tone for years for the organization. Absolutely. When you can have consistency in the continuity that you're talking about uh, and the expectations are set very high, the players understand that, the players know it, uh, and they go out there and, and give what they need to give and, uh, you know, uh, are, are, are competing their tails off to, to win as many games as they possibly can because uh, the expectation is set from the top down. And, and that's what makes great organizations and that's what makes great teams. First time Steve Carse met the boss, George Steinbrenner, was when? Uh, first time I met him was when I came to New York and uh, was signing as a Yankee in, in 2000 and uh, at the winter of 2001 and that, that, that December. Uh, went in there, went to Yankee Stadium, had the opportunity to shake his hand and meet him and, um, you, know, uh, you know, hear him say, welcome uh, to the organization and, uh, you know, we're happy to have you to be a New York Yankee. Interesting, because, you know, I, I, I bring up the example of Seinfeld all the time. And, you know, people really thought that George Steinbrenner spoke like he did on Seinfeld where he's there. He's like, all right, Steve, we got to get it going. We got to get it going. You know, what he, <laughs> but apparently that was he loved it, apparently. But that was really much a parody. So when you first meet him at that press conference, he doesn't come to you and tell you, you better win or else. No, I mean, I, I, already, I already knew it, you know, I mean, I grew up in New York, I read the papers, and I understood, you know, the boss was on the back of the paper, uh, the New York Post or the Daily News many, many times on, uh, you know, his, his rants or him talking about the Yankees and what the expectations were. So coming to the Yankees and growing up in New York, I, I knew what to expect. So even if he would have told me that it, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have shocked me. Maybe a really stupid question, but one I know that the fans would want to know. Meeting him for the first time, knowing his legacy, knowing his personality, or as far as what the media says, 
any butterflies whatsoever, any nerves at all, or at this point you kind of done, done it all, see it all, and uh, it's another day in the office for you. No, of course there's butterflies. I mean, when you when you are going to meet somebody that substantial who uh, is going to pay you a lot of money and uh, come to uh, a team that is has the expectations of winning, uh, you know, obviously there's butterflies in meeting him. You don't know what he's going to say to you. You know, sometimes you don't even know if he's going to know who you are, to be quite honest with you, uh, because he's his lieutenants or his scouts or his front office is giving him the information of, of who to sign and, and what to do. So uh, he ultimately makes the final decision. But one thing I, I you know, being in New York with the boss, uh, everybody was scared to death of him, like the, the workers at the stadium, like so. When he would pull up in his uh, limousine or the car that would bring him to the stadium, uh, all you would hear over the microphones or over the uh, walkie talkies was uh, the coffee's on, the coffee's on. That meant the boss was here. So make sure that everything is tidied up. Make sure you're in your right spot because if anything was out of place, the boss would know. Wow. Okay. So from spring training right through the playoffs, how much interaction, how often do you see him during the season? Uh, you see him a few times. I mean, he, he comes to New York and pops in when, whenever he feels like it. I mean, he was a lot younger, uh, back in the day. So he made more trips to New York. He has a lot of business obviously going on in, in different places. Uh, full time was in Tampa, yes. um, you know, and then, uh, New York was obviously his second home. So, um, he, I, I seen, I seen him quite a bit, to be honest with you, especially in my first year. I mean, every Every other or every third homestand, he would be in there and walking around. And like I said, you would you would hear the walkie-talkies going off, especially when he was walking in the stadium. And uh, the guard knew that the the chains needed to be clipped, and uh, you know everything needed to be you know nice and tidy when he uh, walked in. So from from a player's perspective, uh, knowing you're hearing it over the walkie-talkies where would you actually see him? Like where would, does he ever come down to the clubhouse? Is oh, he, in the clubhouse. Yeah. He, yeah, absolutely. That's where he came. Here's where he'd come down. He'd come and come into the clubhouse and walk around and sit in Joe Torrey's office and, and talk to Joe about whatever they needed to talk about, whether there's players or just uh, shooting the breeze. But uh, yeah, he'd be in and out and, and then he would go upstairs into his box and watch the games. Where, where was his office relatively to Joe's? Or did he, he, I mean, he must've had an office. No, he was up in, he was up in the press box, uh, in the yes. press box area. That's his, uh, one of the suites was, was his office. And that's where he spent, uh, you know, most of, most of his time. Did you ever get into the Steinbrenner suite? No, I never had the opportunity to frequent that. Okay. Did, uh, as far as did he ever bring, uh, for lunches, dinners, as far as interactions with players, as far as meeting him on a personal level, did he level, did he ever do that? Uh, with New York, like especially my first year, you always have a banquet when you leave spring training and come to New York and they run a banquet and he's there and, uh, you know, they have a bunch of donors and they all come to the banquet. We sit up there and we talk to the fans and uh, it's just one of those things where that's where you get the most interaction with them. Banquet at, at the stadium? Uh, no, it was uh, somewhere in New York City, whether it be at the Marriott or uh, one of the hotels that have a, a big banquet room. I, I presume it's not at the Red Roof Inn or TGI Fridays. Uh, I did not see it there, and I did not come there when uh, we had the banquets. It was at one of the leading, uh, you know, hotels that was really nice in the city. And and just as far as for people to picture, as far as when you were on different teams versus the Yankees, was there a different standard as far as hotels staying at in general uh, for the team? Did, did Mr. Steinbrenner create a different aura for you guys versus other teams, would you say? No, you have a traveling secretary. Traveling secretary takes care of all of that stuff. Uh, obviously, the boss probably gives him parameters that he needs to stay within. And then uh, we travel like everybody else. Okay. And as far as memorable interactions, as far as conversations, one of them we had mentioned in the previous episode when he was talking to you, when you're rehabbing your shoulder, other conversations, things that stuck out about George? I mean, just normal conversations, uh, you know, um, in 2003, when I was rehabbing down there as well, uh, he would have a box and we would always go to uh, the lightning games and I would go to the lightning playoff games. I mean, I was rehabbing and had nothing else to do. He would invite me 
me sitting in there with Yogi Berra and George and a couple other guys and just being able to talk to them and, uh, you know, uh, be normal. Uh, it's, you know, not being on the baseball field, not that I didn't want to be on the baseball field, but sometimes injuries occur. And he understood that. And uh, at the end of the day, I was doing everything I could to get uh, healthy. But uh, while I was getting healthy, you know, treated me with respect and uh, invited me to, to, to different, uh, you know, things to do while I was down in Tampa. And as far as the interactions with the alumni, I know that over the years, he, he rebuilt a lot of bridges from spring training on. Uh, were you seeing a lot of alumni coming through the clubhouse and, and, and on the spring training uh, field? Well, there's always alumni coming through. I mean, guys come in and uh, teach, you know, there's Ron Guidry would come in and Goose Gossage would come in. So you would have all of these guys uh, come into spring training and, uh, you know, being guest instructors and doing all of that kind of stuff. And then, um, you know, the interaction with those guys, he tried to just bring them around to give you some experience and to give you some knowledge. Uh, and it, it was a lot of fun being around them. And the other thing too, uh, which was super special to me um, during the season, there would be old timers day yes. and all the old timers would come in the Yankee stadium and you would just really get to rub elbows with them. And, uh, and I was in awe because I've known the history of the New York Yankees and, you know, you watch these guys, uh, you know, playing in the, in the late seventies and eighties. And then you, I, you go back to, you know, the Yogi bears and, um, all the players that have come into Yankee stadium that are older than what I've watched and, and get to ask them questions and learn from them and hear their stories is, uh, was, was one of the special things for me that, uh, I've taken away from being a New York Yankee was old timers day. Any particular ones that you can really sit back and say, like, I was really starstruck. Like I was shocked to see them in real life and like, wow, they are right in front of me here. Yeah, well, he wasn't a Yankee, but Hank Aaron, uh, when he would come in um, and he was, you know, really good friends with Joe and they they had a great relationship. Back I mean, the... he was one. Yeah, he was one of them. I mean, obviously, Yogi Berra was uh, around there all the time, um, you know, and then guys I watched like Orion Guidry and, uh, you know, uh, 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 Ricky Henderson or Mickey Rivers, um, you know, obviously Don Mattingly was on the staff, so. He was a, another guy that I've, I've watched um, growing up. So all of these guys, there's so many to name that uh, it, it's really hard to pick or choose one or two guys. Spending time with Mattingly, was it evident to you that he'd be a big league manager one day? Yeah, he's super smart. I mean, he understands the game. He, he gets the players. He knows how to communicate. And again, he was the hitting hitting guy and he was on the on on that side of the ball the offensive side of the ball so I didn't get to interact with him all that much but when I did have conversations you could see how sharp he was about the game and and how much he understood it another guy that people from past generations would not understand if you're in this modern age but you go back and look at Mattingly's numbers if he had stayed healthy surefire hall of famer just ex such an exciting guy to watch on the field when he came yeah. up wow like I remember him and Boggs and Gwynn like we were very spoiled in that generation. Yeah, he could definitely hit. I, I mean, he just had, uh, you know, he had a bad back and it would act up on him sometimes. And it's unfortunate because when you when you have great players like he was, uh, you, you hope that they can play every day and then uh, you see how special they really are. And I remember he started to DH for Kevin Moss and bring up Kevin Moss again. But man, if you lived through Kevin Moss, like in those, those home runs he had in that short span and he was going to be the heir apparent to Mattingly and that, see those two in the lineup, it was pretty freaking cool. Like if there's one place to make it, like when A-Rod had, remember that was one start of the season, I think he had like 12 home runs in April. And it's just, it's so much fun to watch, especially when it's in pinstripes. Yeah, I mean, you know, every year is a little bit different. I mean, you're watching it now with Aaron Judge, right? I mean, uh, this guy's a monster. He's a tremendous player. And, uh, you know, he's doing a lot of damage. I, I don't even really know what his numbers are, but I know he's in the mid-20s with home runs right now, and uh, we're still at the end of June. So who knows what you're going to see come down the stretch. If he stays as hot as he is, you might see him make a run at uh, Barry Bonds' record. There's rumors that Dave Robertson may be reacquired down the road to get another arm in there. It's just it's an embarrassment of riches again. 
and they're building it up together. And you know what? They're looking pretty good this year. And the Mets uh, as well. It'd be great to have another Subway Series, World Series, but uh, we're a long ways away from there. That being said, can you imagine the Yankees today as they are if Steinbrenner had not bought the team? Imagine where baseball would have been at, you know, for all the money he spent and these super teams that he put together. He left such a legacy on New York, uh, a crown jewel team for baseball, that if he was not the owner, I don't know if baseball is where it's at today. Yeah, that's a great question, right? I mean, that's uh, that's the journey that he took, right? I mean, um, if he doesn't buy the Yankees, are the Yankees the Yankees? I, I don't have that answer. I mean, I don't know. Um, uh, but I, I guess we're all just blessed that he did buy the New York Yankees and he built it into something uh, you know, as a super machine and spent all of that money and gave out the multi-year contracts that he did um, and treated players the way he did. And it obviously carried on. And also he was making money, right? I mean, he's not going to give out money that he's not making. He's a shrewd businessman. He bought the team uh, for a great price and he understood how to grow something into uh, a multi-billion dollar business. It's such a different feeling for sports franchises when you have that single owner that's putting their heart and soul to the team versus a big corporation running it with a board of directors and spreadsheets, income statements, balance sheets, and things of that nature. When the game is run very differently from a team perspective, you know, it makes me think of a, um, an interview I just read with George Lucas the other day talking about Star Wars, for example, and what he did with Star Wars. He sold it for $4 billion. And looking back on the legacy now, Star Wars, he's saying, you know what? I wish I had kept it. You know what? It would have been a lot different. And I think of the Yankees, and now I'm just kind of doing that metaphor thing, but still they're being privately run. If you go and sell to a big corporation that's concerned about dollars and cents, but not putting the heart and soul into it, I don't know if the team is the same thing. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't make it the same product, right? I mean, when you have somebody who is pouring everything that they have into it because they love the team and they love what they do and they love the fans it's just a different vibe than it is if uh, a corporation comes in and says, here's a new stadium, here's new skyboxes, just go and sell them. And if we win, we win. If we lose, we lose. We don't, really don't care. That's not George. That's not his family. That's not who he is. And that's what, not what the Yankees are. And that's why they're beloved. And, you know, for sports franchises and their owners, we have this love-hate relationship with these owners, but we love when they're in the news. We love talking about them. And they become as big of a celebrity, if not more, of their team. And George was as big as they get. I mean, Jerry Jones, I think, is pretty close to there. But there's always going to be only one George Steinbrenner. And it was pretty cool that you were able to play with him and have those stories. Any last thoughts on George? Any last memories you want to share? Uh, all I can say about George is he was a very blessed man. Uh, he was a, a great guy. You know, um, there's stories that, you know, portray him as the boss and how tough he is. Yeah, he was tough, but the expectations and the accountability was there. Uh, and that's what he expected. And I respected that uh, to the umpteenth end. And uh, I just thought he was a tremendous guy. And I was, again, very blessed to know him, play for the New York Yankees and have the opportunity uh, to represent my home city in, uh, in a uniform that I grew up watching. I love it. And, you know, George has not been with us for some time and the legacy continues. They keep winning. Uh, did you have much interaction with uh, the kids at all back then? No, just meeting them a few times in, in Tampa. I mean, obviously at uh, some, uh, you know, engagements like, a, a, you know, a ball or uh, something that they ran for. Uh, promotional stuff uh, in Tampa during spring training, but not, uh, you know, not like what they would have as far as interaction right now with him owning the team and being left uh, by his dad. And sometimes when you hear a little less about them, it's not a bad thing. And clearly I think that uh, they've taken a playbook from their uh, dad and some recipes being followed because it's working. So hats off to them and to a great season so far. And we'll see where 2022 goes. Uh, your team back there still got hope. They're still working hard. You know, we've got a lot of balls still to go. And uh, All-Star Game will be upon us soon. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, 
I'm taking my son to the All-Star game. We're going to have a special bond uh, sitting behind the plate at Dodger Stadium and uh, being able to watch uh, an All-Star game together. And, and it's going to be super special. So I'm looking forward to that. Hopefully I can bring back some some pictures or something that uh, we can kind of pass along to uh, our listeners and, 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 and let them know what kind of experience it was. Because to be honest, I've never been to an All-Star game as a player. I haven't been to an All-Star game as a coach. This will be the first All-Star game I actually go to and it will be with my son. So it's going to be super special. It's a very different feeling being at that game. It's something very, yeah, I can't even describe it. I've been to a couple of them now. And uh, I think you're going to absolutely have a blast. I could tell you that my next trip, we talked about a little bit. I'm off to Pittsburgh. I'm going to go watch the Yankees in Pittsburgh. I wanted to do a road trip with my son and saw the Yankees are going to be in town. I love watching the Yanks. Something about that Pirates Stadium there at PNC with, with the rivers. It's just beautiful atmosphere. And uh, Yankees are probably going to be winning those games. But you know what? It's about also the ball and just the experience. I've always had this image in my mind of getting to see every single Major League Stadium before I pass. And I'm about a third of the way there. So you never know, man. Well, just make sure you bring your umbrella. Absolutely, because there ain't no dome over there. <laughs> Steve, always a pleasure. Uh, one of these days, uh, these guests will be dug up. We'll never, they will be showing up. Until then, we have a lifetime of journeying and baseball stories to tell. So I'll be seeing you back for the next chapter very soon. Absolutely, Jonathan. Thank you. Appreciate it. A pleasure for taking the time. And we'll see you soon, man. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Cheers.